And the Texans have been working on this for 40 years. And they have already gobbled up probably 80% of the labor that was available. Which means, if we're going to rely on the Mexicans to do what we need to do, and oh my god, we need to rely on the Mexicans to do what we need to do, the northern section of the country is not the solution. It's got to be the center. The problem is that the infrastructure isn't there to support it. There are only three, yeah, I'll point, the three black lines, those are the only three intermodal freight facilities within the entire country. They don't interconnect. They just go south on a specific corridor, and they don't really branch off. And if the northern Mexicans have already been metabolized, we have to make it all the way down to Mexico City. That's 1,000 miles away, which means we need to invest at least a trillion dollars in Mexican infrastructure in order to reach at scale the 50, 60 million people who live in the center of the country. And we have to do so in a way that doesn't make the Mexicans think that we're trying to take over which is kind of what we're trying to do. This is going to be touchy, but if we don't pull it off, we will not have the labor to do what we need to do. Because if we still want stuff in a post-China world, we need help to build it. We need a differentiated labor market. And the Mexicans are the only ones within arm's reach that can help with that. There are other players that are further abroad, but we can't integrate with them the same way we can integrate with a neighbor. The Southeast Asian countries look pretty good to me. Thailand is the fastest aging one, but it still has at least another 25 years. The Indonesians and the Vietnamese are great. In fact, the, the Vietnamese are kind of scary. They've expanded their higher educational system with technical skills in mind. 40% of college grads in Vietnam are STEM graduates. They are attempting and it looks like they're going to pull it off, to leapfrog over China from a technological point of view. And they will probably achieve that within the next three or four years. There's also a geography situation that is very helpful. On the left, you're looking at a, a vegetation map, basically, and the green is tropics. And when you think about building infrastructure in tropics, in mountains, on peninsulas, on islands, it's an expensive, ugly business because you really can't get economies of scale. But there's pros and cons to that, too. The con is that these countries have never gone to war with one another like they have in, say, Europe or Northeast Asia. There's not a lot of bad blood. And that means that almost everyone started out in tropical agriculture. And if there's one thing that everyone in tropical agriculture can agree on is it's that no one wants to be in tropical agriculture. In temperate zone agriculture, there's a, there's a value chain. You, can, you don't have to do it all by hand. You can get a tractor, you can get a combine, you can get a spreader. In the tropics, no, 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 tropical fruits, harvested by hand, tended to by hand, transported by hand. You can't have a combine harvesting mangoes. It's all unskilled labor. And so whenever people in tropical ag have a chance, they move out and they go to the cities. And that means population density. Their cities are wildly overpopulated for the skill set of the labor. And that means this is the most competitive part of the world for value-added manufacturing. This is where we're going to see a big footprint expand. Already has. And you're talking about a billion people. There are already more people in coastal Southeast Asia than there are in coastal China. They're probably the biggest winners in the world after Mexico. But it will look different. Population density again. You'll notice that there aren't threads. When you look at a more normal population structure in an industrialized or industrializing country, you get your urban hub, and you've got threads of highways that are densely settled going out to the next population center. And that allows for what we consider to be multi-step supply chains, because there's multiple population centers linked together tightly. You can move things back and forth through the system. That doesn't happen in Mexico. It's desert. It's mountainous. It's jungle. Combination thereof. And so each urban core will be good, very good at one or two things. And that's it, because they don't have access to a complementary system. So what we do in the United States is we might make the frame, we send it across, they put in the spark plugs. They send it back, we put in the computer system. We send it back, they put in the seats. And it's going to different cities each time. And it's that back and forth that makes it work. But they can't do that at scale within their own system. They have to have that partner. 
The Vietnamese do not. It's a much more traditional system from our point of view. And so the Vietnamese can do top to bottom manufacturing. The only thing they have to worry about are the components that they can't make themselves, which are substantial. But you can have Vietnam as almost a one-stop shop for most of what we need. We just can kind of add the dusting of the tech that's necessary to make it work. It's cheaper to do. Unfortunately, it's 7,000 miles further away. So we can't do the back and forth. Two different models. All right, let's talk products. Uh, if you're at the uh, top of this, you don't know who your third tier suppliers are, much less your 13th. If you're at the bottom, you can probably fit your entire supply chain on the back of a cocktail napkin after throwing back a few bourbons. If you're on the left, or excuse me, on the right, uh, you're already within the NAFTA system. If you're on the right, you're dependent on the Chinese. Couple examples, energy. American energy is made with American capital. It's on American pipelines. American workers going to American refineries, ending up with an American consumer. And that is not simple at all. 1,400 supply chain steps for the iPhone, 91% of which involve mainland China in some fashion. The new iPhone just came out a couple weeks ago. You might want to buy two. We're probably getting close to the point where this is the last one. Here's everybody else. Going to pull out a few of these. Uh, automotive, courtesy of NAFTA 2, over 90% of the supply chains for autos sold in North America are manufactured in North America. Don't mean to suggest we're not going to have some hiccups, but the core of it has already worked and the rest is just network effects. That's not bad. In terms of foreign investors, the Europeans are of the belief that they can bring in all the parts and just assemble it here. That's not going to work very well. The Asians have figured out that they need to actually do the manufacturing here. So they're probably north of 70% manufactured within North America, where most European companies are less than 10. Heavy vehicles are gonna be a problem, though. When you have globalization, it's very common for countries to put their thumbs on the scale to encourage parts of the industrial plant to be in their countries, especially if it's something they can technologically do without a lot of help. As big as they are, a forklift is actually simpler than a passenger car in terms of the equipment and the construction. And since not everybody needs a forklift, it's not like you're going to have these facilities everywhere. So the Chinese really have dominated that space. So forklifts, dump trucks, construction equipment, agricultural equipment, we're going to have a real problem when the Chinese go away. But it is a relatively easy fix because anyone who can do automotive at scale can also do heavy equipment at scale. It's just a question of the numbers being right. And nothing like half of the stuff vanishing from the world is going to make the numbers right. That's where I'm worried the most. A successful electronics and computing sector requires a lot of different labor price points. Because the person who does the plastic molding is not the person who does the die cast, or pulls the wire, or builds the chip, or does the software, or polishes the lenses. That's a different step with a different skill set at a different price point. And one of the many reasons that the East Asians are so good at this is you've got 11 different labor sets within one extended market. And they can all specialize at what they do best. We don't have that in North America. We have two price points, us, Mexico, that's it. And so we have to change how this is all done. The textiles example gives me hope that we can, but I have no idea in hell how because we haven't had to figure it out yet. But we're going to have to real soon. And we probably are going to have to do it without northern Mexico, because that's already spoken for. All right, here's where things get a little messy. Not all semiconductors are made equal. We all hear about the CHIPS Act and what the Biden administration wants to do. That's for a very, very specific kind of chip. 10 nanometer and smaller, the most advanced one in the world. Now, today. 92% of those come from Taiwan, 8% from South Korea. If every facility that is under construction in the United States because of the CHIPS Act ultimately comes to fruition, we will be making less than 5% of the global total. It's a start, it's not huge. The, the Koreans and the Taiwanese have been working on this for a long time. Here's the problem. The Taiwanese manufacture most of them. They fabricate most of them. 
but most of the technology that allows them to do so is not Taiwanese. They just have the end production. There's a coalition of over 9,000 companies worldwide, half of which only produce one product for one customer that ends up in a Taiwanese facility. You pull any of those out of the constellation, the whole thing stops until you repair the constellation. We're gonna to have to rebuild an entire environment in order to continue putting these chips together. That's gonna to take a decade. All it takes is one country falling out. I'm personally most concerned about the Germans on this one. Now, on the other extreme, you've got the dumb chips, the 90 nanometer and bigger. This is your internet of things, your, your smart blender, the shower brush that sings to you, your smart lights. 80% of those are made by the Chinese, and they can do that without outside help. The other 20% is kind of a split between Japan and the United States. Now, if the Chinese were to vanish tomorrow, obviously the Internet of Things would just die. I would argue that's not that big of a deal. And we have the technology, we have the knowledge, we don't have to reinvent anything. We just need a couple years to build low-end fab facilities. The Mexicans are very interested in getting into that space. The problem that they face is bilingual technical language skills. If, you ever ha if you've got kids who are looking for a way to make a lot of money really quick, tell them to learn how to assemble chips and to do it in Spanish and go down there and be translators because that is going to be the single biggest friction point in the bilateral relationship for the next decade or two. And then everything in the middle, 10 to 90, that's your car. That's your planes. That's most power management systems. That's smart meters. We're probably okay there because those are made in Germany and Italy and here in Japan and Korea, Taiwan, and even a little bit in China with imported gear. That looks okay. It's the high end I'm really worried about because those high end chips, that's AI. All these server farms are getting built to do AI at scale. No, we're not going to have the chips for it. That's the iPhone. We're not going to have the chips for them. That's electric vehicles. Electric vehicles have two to three grand worth of chips, and they're all either the very high end or the very low end. We won't be able to sustain it and everything that comes from it. Now, for you guys' world more uh, specifically, here's your lives. Yeah, there's no way to fix that fast. Order from everyone, find a way. Counting on half of them not making it. That's the biggest sticking point you guys have by far. This doesn't look that great either. This is space that the Chinese dominate utterly, and replacing that at scale is not a two-year program. It's not just the manufacturer. The assembly requires a lot of fingers and eyes and a lot of quality control, and there is no other country in the world that can step into that space quickly. So we're talking about a significant build-out that's not just capital intensive, but is very labor intensive and it is not clear where, if, that can happen with today's technology. This stuff we kind of do in our sleep. Okay, the stuff in the middle, I'm oh, sorry, no, let me, uh, this is the stuff we do in our sleep. The United States is a weird economy in that we're very, very high end and very, very low end at the same time. We have a lot of elbow room, we have a lot of forest, we have a lot of wood, and courtesy of the shale industry, we have a lot of things that are energy intensive that we're the world's most competitive. None of that's in danger. And this is the stuff that the Mexicans are going to be helping us with. The slower China breaks down, the more time we have to build the industrial plant that we need to give you guys the guts of what you need. But that means working with the Mexicans as forward looking as possible to build the stuff out so we don't start the day that stuff from China just vanishes. Oops. Here we go. My biggest concern about China is the information block it in there has now become so intense that we just can't get information at all. And we might not find out that the government has collapsed until the stuff just stops arriving. We're not gonna have a lot of warning. All right, I showed you guys this last year, population density map on this side, uh, economic map on this side. The areas that are populated are also the areas that are economically viable. It's a pure weather thing. Russia has weather, people live where it's less. 
the Russian strategy is pretty straightforward. Expand out of the weather or the area that's decent until you hit a series of geographic barriers that you can't shove tanks through. And then forward position your military in the access points between them. Ukraine is in the unfortunate position of not controlling those access points, but it's on the way to one in Romania and one in Poland. So whenever the Russians are done with Ukraine, if they can win, they will move on to the next line of countries, five of which are in NATO. American Western foreign policy is very simple. Prevent them from having that opportunity. Now, here we have the Ukrainian demographic structure. After independence in 1992, over a third of the population either left or died. Some of the lowest birth rates we've ever seen. Another third of the population since the war has fled as refugees, mostly women and children. So this is pre-war data. We're very close to the point in Ukraine where they will not have the population density that is required to maintain industrial level infrastructure. So whether it is food or steel or coal or stuff transiting, Ukraine is not going to survive the next 30 years, even if they win the war. There's another problem in that space. This is, um, hang on, my hair's falling apart here. This is the Russian permafrost. It's a geological phenomenon. You go 10 to 30 feet down and you hit a layer where it never melts. But the top chunk melts in the summer and turns into a bog. It is the most difficult environment in the world for mineral extraction. So the Russians have the most expensive, most expensive upfront cost to bring stuff online. You basically have to wait for it to freeze solid. You run a berm out to your production site. You run a rail line or a pipe or a road along that berm. And then you have a, a pad that you drill from when it's frozen because you can't drill through mud. It's a very dynamic landscape because if an aquifer cracks open, everything just kind of slides and follows the aquifer. Or maybe it drains down, in which case you just get a, a sinkhole pit that opens. Or maybe there's no aquifer and you just get a warm summer. And the vegetation that's been frozen for eons starts to thaw, starts to decompose. Decomposing vegetable matter gives off methane and the whole land buckles. Which means that the Russians have the highest maintenance costs for any mineral production in the world. Here's the problem. Russian population structure. Now, about the time that people who were 15 were getting born, 2004, 2005, that's when the Russians stopped collecting data and just started making it up. So you've got that big gouge in the 20-somethings, post-Cold War birth rate collapse, and then you have fabricated data. There probably are only half as many children as this data would suggest. The Russian educational system collapsed back in 1985. So we had a collapse in the birth rate, a collapse of the educational system, which means that the youngest people in Russia who actually have technical skills at scale, they turned 62 this year. The year before the Russians started fabricating data, the life expectancy for the average Russian male was 67. They already had the worst skilled labor pool relative to their population and their needs in the world. And they're very close from simply losing all of it. The maintenance on the Russian systems, the development on the Russian systems, hasn't been done by the Russians for the most part. It's been done by BP or ExxonMobil and especially the Dutch and the Germans and all that went to zero when the war started. So whether it's sanctions, war damage or simple lack of maintenance, we need to prepare for a world where everything that the world has become reliant upon from the Russians, palladium, platinum, oil, gas, even timber, just doesn't come anymore. There's another angle to it that's a little uglier. Now, this guy, uh, you can see where the ethnic Russian territories are in the, the top left. Uh, you've got Turkic minorities off to the east and the south. The problem is this is not an ethnic map. It's a population change map. The green zones are where population growth is happening roughly on pair with Florida and has for four decades. And the red zones are population losses roughly equivalent to Detroit and has been for four decades. Almost all the raw materials are produced in the green zones 
that are not controlled by ethnic Russians, where they're experiencing population growth, but they're shipped through and processed in the red zones, where the last bits of the skilled labor pool are, that is in terminal decline. So you can add demographics to the reasons that we need to kiss the Russian stuff goodbye as well. Not to mention that this is going to be a very politically unstable region in the not too distant future because of the mismatch. One of the many reasons that the Russians feel that the Ukraine war is necessary is if they can get to kind of that outer crustal defense that they used to have in the Soviet period, then they can focus their forces internally to police this demographic flip. They're fighting for time. If they can pull this off, they probably buy themselves another 50 years. If they fail, they're gone within 20. All right, let me take a big dump on green tech. We talked about this a little bit last time I saw you guys. I think I even showed you this graphic. I mean, oversimplifying here, but um, thermal power, internal combustion engines, not all that complicated. You light a match, you start a fire, you capture the heat in some way. Can't do that with an EV system, can't do that with green tech. The process of producing the energy, transmitting the energy, storing the energy, requires an order of magnitude more materials and different materials. We're looking here at an EV versus an ICE vehicle. You can just see at a glance. And then here's the same kind of idea, but for generation, with solar and wind at the top, conventional thermal at the bottom. We need three times as much copper by 2030. We need 20 times as much lithium. We need 10 times as much nickel. There isn't enough on the planet to pull that off. And the Russians are a top three producer of these things. So they just, it, it can't happen. It's not physically possible with today's technology for the world. There is one way it might be possible for us. This is where all the stuff comes from that is not what we would consider to be part of our friends and family network. If we use our military, which is done with the war on terror, which has recruited and rested and rearmed, and we go and conquer all of these places, and we run a Belgian imperial style extraction empire, and bring all of it home, then we can do the green transition, but no one else. Now, this is not a recommendation. I'm just saying that the path we're on, this is the only way that it works. And even that would not be enough because you still have to turn it into processed material. Lithium ore is useless. You have to turn it into lithium metal. The red bars are the stuff that, where that processing happens in either China or Russia. And even that's not enough. You have to talk about finance. Here you're looking at the full cycle cost for a natural gas combined cycle plant. The blue is the construction, the siting, the building. The gray, is the fuel, full life cycle. This is a model you're familiar with. This is what you all do. The idea is it's a subscription model. You pay as you go. That doesn't work for green tech. For green tech, it's almost all up front. This is wind. Capital costs have tripled. They will triple again. I think most of the plans that were put out there four years ago assumed that there would never be a 100 basis point increase in capital costs. We've now gone up by 500. We have another 500 to go. The market can't support this. The IRA will help maybe sand down some edges. But we're going to have to do something that in the United States we really don't like doing. We're going to have to choose what we want to focus on. The smart play would be to put it solar panels where it's sunny, not in Massachusetts. <laughs> put wind turbines where it's windy, not in Florida and wire the power to where we actually live. But we're not gonna do that. that, that's the smart thing. <laughs> All right, another matrix. If you're at the top, you want the government out of your personal life. If you're at the bottom, you think the government should regulate social norms in some way. If you're on the right, you want the government out of your wallet, and if you're on your left, you think the government should intervene in people's wallets to get the resources it needs to remake society in some way. And you can kind of combine these things. So if you're at uh, the bottom right, an economic and a social conservative, uh, you're kind of opposed to food stamps on principle because famine builds character. And if you're at the, 
If you're at the top left, a social liberal and an economic conservative, you want to bring all of the bureaucrats in Washington together for a big party where you'll serve arsenic cake. <laughs> Here are our political factions. The single biggest effect that Donald Trump had is he elevated a faction to prominence that really hadn't voted before. Most of the people who voted for him the first time he ran for president hadn't voted in the previous four presidential elections. A lot of different estimates for how many people that is, but all of them are north of 10 million voters. They are now not simply the single largest voting bloc in the country. They've taken over the Republican Party. Because in calling to these people, Trump ended up picking fights with what he would call the rhinos. People who are, were the traditional leaders of the, 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 the traditional leaders of the policy. He ejected them from his White House. He ran. He campaigned against their candidates in Congress, and he completely purged them from the Republican national conventions. They're not even present in the decision-making apparatus of the party now. And in effect, they've become swing voters. But he was able to attract other factions that were closer to his social con Everyone, Peter here coming to you from flat on my back in bed because I threw out my back. Uh, this is the last one I record from here. Um, we have a data update from the U.S. government, specifically the Department of Energy's Energy Information Agency, which tracks energy production, usage, and prices and everything. And their, their data for calendar year 2023 indicates that the average price for natural gas in the country was just over $2.50 per thousand cubic feet. Uh, in fact, it bottomed out at just below $2.20 in May. And this is after a really volatile year in calendar year 2022 when because of the Ukraine... Oh, yeah. Cat says hello. Where because we'll just we'll just do that. Where because of the Ukraine war, uh, there was high demand everywhere, and everyone was trying to get away from Russian natural gas. Uh, in that calendar year, U.S. prices hit nearly ten dollars, but that was nothing compared to what happened in the rest of the world, with prices for several months being above fifty and even approaching a hundred in a few areas, which still boggles my mind that we actually hit those numbers. Anyway, twenty twenty three was much calmer. Uh, and the reason for it is twofold. Um, number one, that the United States is not just a producer and exporter of natural gas, but it does so using a series of technologies that are broadly not applicable in the rest of the world, uh, the shale technology and fracking. Because of this, the United States has a break-even price in our pure uh, shale natural gas fields typically below five and in some places below three dollars per thousand cubic feet and second we get a lot of associated natural gas production that comes from our shale oil operations which you know technically uh based on how you're running the numbers that could be free uh anyway it means the united states is the world's largest producer of natural gas kicking out about 120 billion cubic feet per day or 1200 billion cubic meters per year and most of that is trapped in the system at home because moving natural gas from A to B is kind of difficult. There's really only two routes. One is to have a pipeline network that sends it from production to consumption locations. Usually those are within individual country because natural gas, being a gas, is hard to store. And the U.S. does have the world's largest system for distribution uh, by far. And, well, the second option is to chill it down to negative 300 odd degrees uh, into liquid form and then put it onto a specialty tanker to send it across the ocean to someone who has a specific receiving facility who can take the liquid and regasify it without it blowing up. Um, all of that is as expensive as it sounds. So what happened in 2022 in Europe was the Europeans used to be on a piped system that brought in stuff from northwestern Siberia for the most part. And that gave them access to reliably large and reliably cheap supplies. So when the Europeans decided to move on from the Russians, they had to go to a, some other piped suppliers that they have, uh, specifically Algeria, Libya, and especially Norway, but that wasn't enough. So they had to go out and tap the world for liquefied natural gas, which is not available in large volumes in the way that piped gas from a neighbor can be. And so prices went up and up and up and up. And in the United States, we sent everything that we could. Uh, and that allowed the Europeans a degree of energy security, but only at a very, very high price point. Uh, what we're seeing now is the slow motion, so far slow motion, degradation of the Russian system. Because their pipes are all oriented towards Europe. And they are falling into disrepair because they're not being used. And the Russians are using all their technical 
experts to maintain their war effort. Uh, they do have a couple of liquefied natural gas facilities, some in the far east on the island of Sakhalin, north of Japan, and some on the Yamal Peninsula in far northwest Russia. But it is foreigners who provide the technical skills for those facilities to operate. And as those technical skills are increasingly withheld, these facilities will fall into disrepair. And, um, well, let's just say when you've got a refrigeration unit that is dealing with billions of cubic of meters of uh, flammable materials and something goes wrong, something goes wrong all at once. We haven't had any industrial accidents at these facilities yet, but it's only a matter of time, one year, two year, five years, I don't know how long, before those facilities go offline and then Russian natural gas will be gone. Uh, getting it out by other means is nearly impossible. There are very few countries that can do LNG liquefaction. China is not on that list. Most of them are part of the Western Alliance plus Japan that is back in Ukraine. And if you're going to send a pipeline from the Mural Peninsula to populated China, you're talking about the world's largest chunk of infrastructure with roughly 70% of the train it's going to cross being virgin with no existing infrastructure at all. So you're talking tundra and tegai and permafrost and mountains. Um, building that pipeline would be a $100 billion project. It would take a minimum of 15 years. And even if it was done, uh, the cost of operating it would be two, three, four times as much as the natural gas would be worth. So the Russians and the Chinese have repeatedly said that this pipeline is going to happen. They've been saying that for 20 years. And then you get down into the details and the Chinese are like, yeah, and the Russians are going to pay for the operation of the pipeline. And the Russians are like, yeah, the Chinese are going to pay for the operation of the pipeline. And that's why nothing has started. So the world has to get by without Russian natural gas. And until a year and a half ago, they were the world's largest exporter. Uh, that is going to have big price implications everywhere except in countries that produce natural gas for themselves, uh, read the United States. Now, that means in the United States, the 2 to $3 range we're in right now is more or less normal. We're not going to go ag above 5 for any more than very short periods of time because what we've discovered is that the shale gas guys can bring on well wells in a matter of weeks. If you remember your shale history back between 2004 and 2011, roughly, it was all about the natural gas. And then in 2011 to 2013, uh, oil really came into its own. And natural gas faded, not because we weren't producing it, but because we were producing it as a byproduct of oil production. What we saw in calendar year 2023 when prices were going up is that the shale guys went back to the old natural gas fields and were able to produce using the tricks they had learned in the shale oil fields in the last 10 years. And that pushed down the cost of production and pushed up the volume of natural gas that was produced by massive volumes. And we basically got back to a balanced market. Now, the United States does have takeaway capacity to get some of that natural gas to international systems. We have roughly 10 billion cubic feet of pipeline capacity, mostly in Mexico, and about another 10 billion cubic feet for LNG, which is mostly going to Europe now. Uh, that's in comparison to 120 billion cubic feet of overall production, which is a number we now know that we can increase in fairly quick succession when we need to. So again, prices should be lower for longer. We might have those occasional spikes, but then the shale guys will just drill and bring the price right back down. Now, why does that matter to you? Three big reasons. Number one, natural gas remains the number one fuel source for electricity generation in this country, about 40% of the total. So anything that requires electricity, which is almost everything, uh, natural gas is the, the solution, at least in the midterm. And since the United States needs to roughly double the size of its industrial plant, as the Chinese fade away, we basically need 50% more electricity. Natural gas is going to be a huge component of that. Second, Let's say you don't like fossil fuels at all. Let's say that you're a greenie and you like solar and wind. Well, you should still like natural gas because when the wind doesn't blow or when the sun doesn't shine, which happens, you know, every night, you need a partner fuel in order to keep the lights on. And natural gas combined cycle power generation facilities can spin up and spin down in less than 15 minutes. So they are the best um, partner for green tech that we have. And while the Californians don't like to say it out loud, about half of their energy that they generate within California itself comes from natural gas, specifically because of this pairing capacity. Uh, batteries cost an order of magnitude more. They don't last very long. Uh, and they have some other problems with their construction that is ugly from any number of strategic and green points of view. Natural gas is a known. And as long as we're going to be moving towards wind and solar for most of this country, 
uh, even in increments, natural gas is the logical partner for all of it. And then the third thing is a little bit more esoteric, and that has to do with what happens in manufacturing once you decide you want to really get into everything. In globalization, we have broken up the supply chains. Energy comes from someplace, iron ore comes from someplace, steel comes from someplace else, plastics comes from someplace else. It's brought together for assembly at different locations. As the world breaks apart and we have a more national or continental system, more and more of those intermediate steps need to be done at home or near home. And a lot of those intermediate steps use raw materials that are made from natural gas. So natural gas makes naphtha, makes polyurethane, makes plastics. Naphtha makes fertilizers and pesticides, makes agricultural products. Uh, natural gas is the base material for a lot of this stuff. And now the United States is the largest producer, supplier, and exporter of all of those intermediate products. And what we're do seeing now is the U.S. moving up the production chain, moving in a greater value-added production system for all of this so that we can still do the classic manufacturing and have the entire input system at home. So to have natural gas at these price levels for a very long time is great, and it's going to be a very long time. We largely stopped looking for natural gas about 10, 15 years ago because we knew at that time we had over 130 years of supplies at current rates of production. Uh, and we proved in 2023 that it's pretty easy to bring even more online. So this is going to be the norm for the United States while it goes through these massive reindustrialization phases. And natural gas will both power, fuel, and provide the base materials to make all of it possible. And that is not going to be replicated anywhere else. No one else can produce natural gas at the price point that the United States can. And no one else has natural gas production facilities relatively close to their population centers like the United States does. So this, this is our new normal. And it's going to provide the bulwark for American industry for at least the rest of this century. Everyone, Peter Zion here coming to you from Kalea at the southern point of the island of Hawaii. You got the slopes of uh, Moana Loa behind me, the, the larger volcano here. I uh, am going to take something from our Ask Peter forum. We're going to put that link here at the end of the video too, in case you were sending your own questions. And it's, am I worried about Ukraine in the light of what has become an American boycott on weapons supplies? Uh, and yes, yes, I am. Uh, the Ukrainians are running out of ammo. There's no way they could produce enough to support the war themselves. And the Russians are have mustered a fresh human wave. And, you know, human waves are very vulnerable to mass fire, but you have to have ammo for that to work. So there are some concerns. We might be seeing a turning point in the war here in the next few weeks if something doesn't change. Uh, but what is going on is we've got a dozen, roughly, uh, Republicans on the right who are blocking anything from happening in Congress that they don't agree with. And so this is not a Ukraine problem. This is an everything problem. Uh, these few reps are blocking anything on any issue. So we've got programs that need to be addressed, not just Ukraine, but aid for Taiwan against China, aid for Israel against Hamas. Uh, there's issues with health care and business reform and criminal justice reform, the, cell, the defense system and the budget. Every single thing has been dropped. Uh, it's not that these folks oppose Ukraine per se, it's they oppose anything that isn't exactly their way. So I call them the Greenpeace faction of the Republican Party because they just hate everyone. Uh, this means that this Congress has been the least productive in American history. At this stage in Congress, a little bit more than halfway through their session, uh, we've only passed about 20% of the bills that the second least productive Congress in history has passed. So this isn't an issue of big government versus small government. This is just an issue of dysfunction. And it's a problem for everybody. Now, I don't think it's going to get any better any soon. When the Republicans didn't do very well in the last midterms, the hope of getting a big majority vanished, so they had a very slim minority beginning, and they have seen that minority shrink down. In part, it's because they've cannibalized their own. This faction of Republicans forced out the former Speaker uh, McCarthy from California, and so he just quit. He left the House altogether, leaving that seat open. We've had another uh, couple of resignations since, and then the Republicans purged one of their own, uh, Republican Santos of New York, uh, for, let me make sure I get this right, 
using campaign finance to purchase gay fetish foot porn. Ah, uh, can't make this shit up. Anywho, what it means is not just that the margin that the Republicans have in the majority has gotten smaller and smaller, worse than it sounds. Because to pass something in Congress, you don't need a majority of the votes, you need a majority of the seats. And so every empty seat kind of acts as a quasi vote against the majority. So they only have a, the Republicans now only have a margin of two. They need can only lose one vote if they still want to get things passed. And that makes each individual faction, including the Greenpeace faction, more powerful. So this is going to go one of two ways. Number one, they're going to continue to stall everything. And this Congress will go down in history as the most pathetic ever until we have general elections a year from now. Uh, November, and the new Congress would sit in January, or uh, the bulk of the Republicans uh, reach across the aisle and start cutting deals with centrist Democrats. Now, that's not as easy as it sounds. There's a lot of minutia. There's a lot of politics. There's a lot of noise. And in the environment that we're in right now, anyone who reaches across the aisle is inviting a uh, primary challenge from the freak wings of their parties, whether it's the Greenpeace faction or the Republicans or the squad version of the Democrats. So none of these are easy decisions, but they do suggest that drama in Congress is going to increase, or rather than decrease, in the months ahead. And that's not just bad for Ukraine, that's bad for everyone, except for the Chinese who think this is fantastic. All right, that's it for me. Take care. Hey everybody, Peter Zion here, coming to you from above the very active Kilauea uh, volcano. That's the crater that like, cooked off uh, last year. Uh, today we're going to talk about an assault that happened last week. The Ukrainians sent a squad of drones north out of Ukraine, over Russian airspace, into the Gulf of Finland to attack the uh, Uga Ust. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, oil refinery and loading facility. Now, normally this wouldn't really matter because normally drones, as we've seen, can't get through any sort of meaningful air defense. But the Russian air defense in this area appears to be just as crappy as it is everywhere else in the country. So a bunch of them got through. Uh, the other reason I wouldn't normally care about this is most refineries, everyone gets all ooh and ah. They expect Hollywood explosions when a bomb goes off in a refinery. You know, you got to keep in mind scale here. Most refineries are over a square mile, and this one's no exception. Uh, there's a lot of standoff distance among the different facilities. So if something does blow, it doesn't blow up the whole thing. And crude oil at room temperature isn't even flammable. So the warheads that these bombs can carry, which are less than 100 pounds, uh, probably with the models that were used, probably under 20 pounds, uh, it's you know, that you can't do damage, but you can't do real damage. But this is not just a refinery. This is also a loading facility. And in a refinery, once you've made your fuels, fuels being more flammable than raw crude, you then put them into a truck or a pipe and send it away. With a port facility, you put into a big giant tank, and then a large vessel comes by and sucks off what it needs and goes on its merry way. And so the tanks themselves are the vulnerable points here. Now, judging from the size of the explosions and the fires that were started, the tanks were not hit. That's just something that you should have in the back of your mind when you're evaluating when somebody says a refiner, a certain piece of energy infrastructure was hit, so you know what to look for. Uh, what's interesting here, two things. Number one, it took the Russians uh, more than three days to put out the fire, and they put it out the wrong way, uh, using water in, you know, the near Arctic winter, uh, which caused a lot of water to freeze and then expand and wreck more infrastructure. Damage assessments are still underway. We don't know how bad it was, and had this been a normal attack, we would have known within 24 hours whether or not anything substantial had been done. But here we are nearly a week out, and we still really don't have any more, but, but the vaguest ideas, and the facility is shut down. Now, there's a lot of reasons why this matters. Number one, while the Europeans have put sanctions on seaborne crude, seaborne oil product is in a loophole. So they were still taking stuff from this facility, and with its shut down, all of a sudden, sanctions have gone up to a whole new level, and we're going to have a very good idea of how the Europeans can absorb or not this newest change. Quick add-on, uh, the Ukrainian attack on Usluga was on Sunday the 21st, and less than 72 hours later, the uh, Russians were able to begin shipping out again. However, what is being shipped out is primarily, well, almost exclusively, uh, oil and something called condensate, which is kind of a, a raw product somewhere between natural gas and oil. Uh, the actual refining complex remains completely offline. There's no nap, there's no fuel, there's no intermediate products that are coming out at all. 
And at present, the Russians are still completing their damage assessments. And at the pace they're going, we probably won't have any information of, on the level of damage until probably March. And then, with their very, very thin remaining skin of skilled labor, they can start talking about repairs. Second, this is the first significant Ukrainian attack against a significant economic asset of the Russian Federation. And at least on the surface, it looks like it was much more successful than they ever thought was possible. Uh, that means that the northern parts of the Baltic Sea and the Gulf of Finland are suddenly in a danger zone that is well within the Ukrainians' proven range of operation. Now, the Ukrainians and the Russians haven't really gone against civilian shipping right now, but I can't think of a better target than an oil loading and refining platform such as what we've got in Usugla. Again, apologies for the inaction. We're, we're just going to put the spelling right here so you can see what I'm having the trouble with. Okay. Uh, so this is the sort of thing we should now watch for in the future, because this is not the only facility of this type, which is within the Ukrainians' reach. There are a number of facilities at Novorossiysk on the Black Sea and Tuapsa on the Black Sea, and closer to St. Petersburg, also on the Gulf of Finland. And now that the Ukrainians have proven that a few things can slip through, you can bet that they're going to target all of them. And all told, if you look at all of the infrastructure combined, its combined export and throughput capacity is in the vicinity of three and a half million barrels a day, which is about three and a half percent of global output. So if you put a meaningful dent in the export infrastructure, it's impossible for the Russians to shunt this stuff somewhere else. There's nowhere else to go. Uh, and so it just backs up through the system. Uh, there's also one other thing to look at. The fact that the damage control crews proved to be so incompetent is something that we're starting to see at the edges, as the Russian economic system phrase. Uh, the Soviet educational system collapsed back in 1986, which means that the youngest people who are worthy of terms like engineer turned 64 this year. And so when I think of fire suppression, I think of something that normally I could not just pick up the hose and go do it. You want someone with specialized training. And especially if you're talking about petroleum, natural gas, or refined product, fires, you definitely want someone has some idea what they're doing. Russia's running out of those people. It's not just that a million people have fled the country and a half a million have been drafted and committed to the war, been killed. Uh, they don't have much of a skilled labor pool left. And what they do have is being dedicated to the war itself, air defense in the vicinity of the war, or the military industrial complex to keep the war going. So we're seeing some very serious frays with the system. This, this is not the sort of thing that they should have gotten wrong. That fire should have been put out very quickly with things like foam, and it wasn't. Uh, and that suggests the Russians' ability to maintain their overall system is starting to feel the strain of all of this, and they don't have a backup plan. There isn't enough labor in the country to redirect from somewhere else, especially skilled labor. All right. That's it for me. Take care.